What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're doing this thing from the car. As you can tell, I didn't realize it, but I'm losing my voice. And we're here with my initial reactions to the Detroit Lions first round pick. And I really can't believe I'm saying this. Terion Arnold. So let's get it started. Welcome, everybody, to our video. Glad you guys are here. And yes, we're back with another instant reactions video as the keys fall. And this is not something I would have really ever anticipated I'd be making a video on. Not unless the Detroit Lions sat there and said, man, let's really dip into the future assets that we have to go get this player. That would have been the only way I could have seen this possible. And you know what's so great about this draft pick before I start talking about the player specifically is the backstory. The backstory is what makes this such an awesome draft pick for me personally. Because as you guys know, there can be bias when you're watching certain players when you go into watching specific players. And really the, the main message that I'm going to get to here is this was my number one corner in the draft. And that's not something I'm saying after the fact. Like, oh, of course he's saying that now. No, this was my number one corner. I did a ranking video and I updated a few things. You can see that community tab. But I did a ranking video. And if you look at that video, my number one cornerback was Terion Arnold, above Quinion Mitchell, above Nate Wiggins, above Kool-Aid McKinstry was Terion Arnold. And what's so great about that backstory is that going into it, Terion Arnold was one of the last cornerbacks that I had watched for the cornerback, especially at the top. Like for that process of going through these guys, Terion Arnold was one of the last cornerbacks that I had watched. So for me, I was going into it, you know, kind of with like that mindset. This was not the right mindset to have thinking that, okay, he's the top corner. Every mock has him going first when he used PFF. Let, you know, I'm probably just not going to like this guy, you know, whatever. He's going to go one, not going to pay much mind to him. So I came in with a terrible mentality to watch a player with, but I didn't take my notes from that day. I came back and I said, I'm gonna keep an open mind because I learned from last year and I learned from you, Brad Holmes. You can't overlook anybody. Jack Campbell, Jameer Gibbs, don't overlook anybody at any position because it's possible. Say it's impossible. He'll show you it's possible. And there's no way I would have ever thought that this player would have gotten down this far in the draft. But Brad Holmes sitting back and after Quinion Mitchell went and we heard rumors before the draft, like the Lions would be willing to trade if he fell to a certain spot. But then when we were sitting there and he saw that clock running, we were live on LNU and I was just saying to myself, this is the spot to do it because Dallas can move out, right? Depending on, I thought Dallas at the time was going to go receiver. They went tackle. Dallas can move out and you got to get in front of Tampa and you know, Green Bay's not going to take a cornerback. They're probably going to go offensive line. Like this is the spot to do it. And they did it. But to even get to that spot, I come in with this terrible mentality for watching a cornerback. Pretty much already putting myself in a position where it's like, I'm not going to love this guy. He may think he's good, but I'm not going to love him. And I was blown away. I was blown away. Multiple games in, I was like, nope, this is the best cornerback in the draft. I don't know what I was, you know, whatever I came in with, he washed that away. This was the best cornerback in the draft for me. Okay, and it's been like that for a while. If you watched any of our mock drafts, this was the best corner of the draft. We just did a mock draft where I traded up to nine to go get this player. I traded up with the Bears to go get Terran Arnold, right? You guys saw that. We're doing a live four on mock. Check it out. I traded up to number nine to get this player. But as unlikely as that seems, I, I was pretty sure we weren't going to do that. And I was on board for trading back. Absolutely. And I still was through this draft until Quinion Mitchell went and it started to make itself clear like, oh, snap, we might be able to really get this guy. As much as it felt impossible, I didn't want to overlook anything. So I have my notes on Terran Arnold. And this is, you know, this is not biased because my notes are right here. I had written this weeks ago, right, on Terran Arnold. And I'm glad I had them with me because I'm going to read through some of the notes that I had on Terran Arnold, why I thought he was the best cornerback in this draft, why he stood out to me so much stood out to me so much when watching this player and why he is also a perfect Detroit Lion. Like he is a slam dunk of a cornerback prospect for the Lions. Not only do we finally get a cornerback prospect in the draft, a wide cornerback that is, but man, we get the best one. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to agree with me, but that's my take. And I'm going to give you what my notes were. So we'll not go through all these and we'll have a breakdown at some point, but to this point, First off, reactive athleticism. It's a critical factor. I gave him a great grade here. I thought this is where he stood out. Reactive athleticism. The only guy that I put in a similar category was Nate Wiggins. Any cornerback they watched, the only guy that I believe had a similar grade was Nate Wiggins at corner. He was a freakish reactive athlete. Runs like a 4 2 4 3 40. This player at 5'11 and a half, 5'116, 189 at 21 years old. All right, let me make that clear. How old is Brian Branch? We drafted him 21 years old. 21 years old. And I think this shows up. He's youthful. There's FBI things. I have him with an average grade in that sense. There's certain situations where I think he passes off routes to nobody. And it's like, oh man, what are we doing here? Just leaving a guy wide open, right? He runs a crosser and you just give him off and then there's just nobody to pick him up. But reactive athleticism, great. Comparable to Nate Wiggins. I understand the 40 time. Oh man, the guy, he ran a 4 5 40. 35 and a half inch vertical with shorter than 32 inch arms. None of those are going to stand out. None of those are going to blow you away. But it's the cornerback position. There's nuance to it. And for me, the footwork, twitch in his lower body that made me feel like I was watching a slot cornerback. I wrote it down. I, I'll show you all the notes. 
I'll give you all a little sense of what I'm talking about. Feel the page because it's a disaster. Slot quarterback twitch in the lower body, okay? That's what I thought when I was watching him. I was like, I don't see a 4-5 at all. I didn't even know he ran that time. Like, this guy is so twitchy in the lower body. So the reactive athleticism, whether it was easy lateral footwork in press situation, he stays in his seat when he's opening his hips, you know, kind of that transition situation, which is the other area where I gave him and close to elite grade in terms of the transition, which is opening your hips, getting out of breaks, planning and driving at the top of the route. Now, I thought that his plan to drive burst was closer to average, so his play speed to me fell a little bit more to the good category. But that being said, his recovery speed was very good. And that can come back to tracking ability. You see it, you know, with certain cornerbacks where you feel like when they look back for the ball, they really slow down. I thought Cam Hart had some of that. Yeah, the recovery speed to me was pushing a great grade. But for me, the transition and deflection, the hips at the top of the route to sink, the half turn to square is very fluid, and then also the incredibly loose hips with smooth transitions. It's easy ability to get down depth when he's in a half turn position now by little knocks here we're getting pulled into sprint a little bit early on some of his spots but for the most part mirrors whip routes from behind like the control that you would see him play with when the receiver's running a rip route you just kind of sit down behind it just sit underneath and just lurk it and a dig he just sits right in your hip you saw the play they showed the highlight i think it was against lad mcconkey where he broke it up that's just what he does he gets in your hip at the top of the route he understands pacing so well and he just tightens up airspace immediately as soon as you go into that break ball skills all right now i don't have the numbers right here because i don't put the numbers on a sheet usually but i have with very good ball skills. A playmaker after he comes down with the interception. And, you know, some scouts, I guess, do look for that. Like, what do they do once the ball gets in their hands? Are they going to turn things into point? That was the very first note that I had. Tracking speed. As I just touched on with guys like Cam Hart, that tracking speed that maintains. You'll see that with receivers as well. Um, the scoop technique, which was scooping the ball off the turf. I thought that was natural. You talk about the hands there. He's physical when he rips away at, at the hands at the catch point. Makes the wide receiver work. Even if you look at some of the contested grabs that were made on him, he made the receiver battle to the ground. So when you have ball skills, good play speed and excellent reactive athleticism your critical factors already have just hit super high marks and automatically i'm like yeah he's checking all the major boxes that we need to based on what we did with our scouting job in the past then he move on to specific coverages i won't read through all these to me he was a great press cornerback that's where i liked him the most was in press situations you know the bend that he played with you also saw just the fluidity the footwork off the line of scrimmage specifically there he had a lot of success controlling routes through the stem he reads the body torso instead of you know necessarily reading all the head fakes and you know the little movement by the receiver to get you to bite or overstep or declare your hips. You see the same with the Kool-Aid. I think Kool-Aid plays with really good balance, but Kool-Aid doesn't play with the same reactive athleticism, you know, kind of speaking to that. And I think that opens up a lot of flexibilities. And I didn't think yeah, he was perfect here. You'd see him overstep stems. You'd see some things like that, but I thought he was great there. Off-man coverage, I gave him a good grade and zone man coverage was kind of in the same area for me. A little bit lower in both of those spots from zone coverage and off-man coverage. Mainly zone, I thought um, underneath cover, sometimes he wouldn't, you know, necessarily overlap certain coverages, but cover four speed and then cover three discipline as well. Like both of those spots, whether that's quarters or whether that's playing a half turn situation. Situation. I thought that he was fine there. And a lot of that comes from big time reactive athleticism. And then off man coverage for me, it was, you know, really just keying in on a receiver's break to be able to dive, plant, break on the football. All situations of, I thought his footwork could get a little messy in these spots, man, or he's a young prospect. And then to wrap it up, run support, I gave him a great grade here. I thought he was awesome in run support. And this is the reason that he looked like a lion. Why well, I love Nate Wiggins, but I was like, I don't think Nate Wiggins would be a lion's pick. But this guy could be if he was there. I just didn't think he would get there. It's flexion as a tackler. It's because of his ability to hold edge contain as a tackler. His physicality is a plus when he gets into battles and he doesn't tackle high either there was a play against lsu that i guess i noted down where he completely blew up a screen so i loved his run support as well i touched on the transition inflection i think is big time and then the football intelligence which really the only place that i didn't have a great grade on this player was football intelligence where i had him slightly above average because like i said there would be some matchup breakdowns you can check out old miss if you want to see some examples of that and you can see situations where maybe he'd be a little bit late like for example against lsu you know you have a curl and then you have a, a fade route from the slot and he could be a little bit late in some of those transition so that's like one of those areas where football intelligence wise as a young player like i think some of those things will have to come along but athletically speaking there was no knocks you know really at all like he was so incredible as an athlete he was physical against the run so you didn't have some of the knocks that he may have had against terry which wasn't that terry was a bad run defender it's that he didn't always want to stick his nose in this guy did not show that first play you don't see that whatsoever in his game and then the ball skills are really good and when you have that combination when your critical factors are all very good it's hard to knock that player. And for me, you know, there was things that I could find in every guy. There's things I could find in every player. But when for me, it's that occasionally he has some breakdowns in coverage because he's trying to pass it off to someone that's not there. Nothing like extreme, just like, okay, maybe being a tick late in this spot. And you're going to be a man-heavy corner anyway. When that's your biggest knock, and I still have it as a slightly above average grade, there's not really that many major weaknesses in your game. And to me, that's why he was cornerback number one. So check out my rankings if you don't believe me. He is cornerback one. I love the backstory to this because I'm just so glad I didn't overlook this player. I didn't. I did not. I was like, I'm not going to do that this year. And what do we know? Brad Holmes does it again. Takes the best cornerback, in my opinion, in the draft at pick 24. Now, I'm initially coming into it. I would love to move back. You know, absolutely. But when if you would have told me Terry was there at 24, I'd be like, yeah, you got to go get him.
No, no question. You have to go get him. And by the way, the ball is the board is falling early with offense going off. I pay, believe we gave up our 73rd pick and we recouped a seventh round next season. It stinks to give that up. You know, 61 definitely feels like a trade out spot. Now I, I would definitely keep an eye on that. Um, but it could also just be a player. Like, I mean, if they said a 61, like, oh, we love this receiver. He's just chilling there. And they just wanted to take a receiver from that spot. Go for it. Like, like I would have no issues with that whatsoever. You'd have a break, right? Hey, 164, unless you package some things together, you can move up. Maybe you got some, you know, late round picks. You got a couple of fours next season. Maybe Maybe you could try to push back up, you know, if you want to. So you're going to have flexibility through next year's picks. But overall, you take the best player available. This was hands down the best player available at a position of need. Brian Branch and Terran Arnold together is just ridiculous. I, I I can't really express what I'm saying. I will be louder, but my voice is gone. So I don't really know what else to say. I don't know how else I can explain to you that not only was this the best cornerback to me, but I think he had a case to be the best defense player in this draft. And I can't officially point to like rankings that I had in the past to say like, oh, I definitely had him ranked here. So I'm not going to do that because it's unfair. But if you watch any of our mock drafts, things like that, like, for example, I know I said this, you know, on video when Easy asked me, Jared Verse, uh, Jared Verse versus um, Taron Arnold. I was like, yeah, Taron Arnold's higher on my board. Like, Taron Arnold was like, well, if you trade up to 14-15, would you take, I'd take Taron Arnold. Taron Arnold, to me, is better than that player. And Latu has the injury history. You could argue him. I would have, you know, Dallas Turner was, you know, kind of the guy I expected to go off first. He fell a little bit. So for me, like, you know, whether or not I thought he was the top defensive player, I don't exactly know. Um, but he was my top cornerback and I had great grades on Kool-Aid, great grades on Nate Wiggins. I've had, dude, I, I, I put Quinion Mitchell at four. I just love the top corner, but I love the cornerbacks this year. And you came away with my favorite one, the best one in the draft. This is incredible. And actually the Detroit Lions just completely redid their entire cornerback room with basically two third round picks. They said, okay, we're going to move up with one and we're going to go with Carlton Davis with the other. If you would have came into this offseason saying, hey, you're going to have to slide up a little bit of that first round pick, but you're going to have to give up both of your thirds, all right? Both of your thirds, but you're going to walk away with Carlton Davis and Taron Arnold. Would you do that? Yes, I would do it. Are you kidding? What? what? Turn off the Xbox, bro. What are we talking about? I'm going to leave it right here. I'll see you all for tomorrow. We're going to be live on Bleacher Report, man. Tune into that. And then day three will be live on my channel. Thank you, bro, for watching. And I'm out.